you open your Bibles today, here we are, July 17th, continually talking about what it means to be an effective witness for Christ. And I began reading from Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and verse 1. It says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So again, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 1. As a prisoner of the Lord. Now let's focus on those words for a minute. As a prisoner for the Lord. So what would be an obvious description, explanation of what those words would mean? As a prisoner for the Lord. Where would Paul become a prisoner? Where would he be in prison? Rome. So literally, he was a prisoner. He would be in chains, and he would be killed. He would be a martyr for the Christian faith. He would, he would die because that was the price he was willing to pay. He had fallen in love with Jesus because Jesus had fallen in love with him. Maybe a strange way of saying it. But we love him because he first loved us. And he died for Paul. He died for you. He died for all of us. And the Apostle Paul, who we're reading about here, he was in love with Jesus. And to die for him was what he was willing to do. And so he was a, he was a prisoner. But what does it mean even spiritually? He was a prisoner of the Lord in what regard? He had, he had thrown all things in life. He had thrown all the things in life that didn't matter. He had thrown them to the side because in his heart, he was a prisoner of the Lord. He was a prisoner in a sense, what does prison do? It confines you. It changes your life, right? When you think of prison, I've never been in prison. At least not yet. Uh, sometimes we say, well, the only difference between me and the person in prison is that I didn't get caught. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. Um, I certainly know better than anybody else. But as a prisoner, what happens when you're in prison, your life is, is held captive, right? And when I'm truly in love with something, some person, your life is a prisoner in a way, in a good way. In a good way. You're in a marriage and you're in love with your wife and your life and your wife's in love with you. Let's say as an example. That's a good thing, right? That's a wonderful relationship. You're a prisoner of each other. Why? Because you used to run around and do all these things, but because now you're in love with this particular person, I'm using this as an example, suddenly all the things that used to be important to you and the things you used to do all the time, all the softball games, for example, you used to be involved in, and all the different leagues, whatever, I'm just throwing out examples. You kind of quit all that stuff because, wow, you found out that that person you're married to, wow, they're, they're something else. And you love to be around them as much as you can, right? And so you become a prisoner to that relationship. But that's, a, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's what Paul was saying. I'm a prisoner to the Lord. I didn't have, he didn't. In other words, he's saying, I didn't have to be in prison. He didn't have to. He, at any time, he could have denied Christ. Or he could have made Christianity like I've done, unfortunately. And I say this to my shame. Make it a hobby. You know, a lot of people are that way. I'll be a Christian as long as it doesn't interfere in my personal life. It doesn't interfere in the way I live. It doesn't interfere with the way I talk. So that becomes like a hobby. Like you're building a model when you get time. You know, I've been working on this model for 20 years. I could have put it together in one hour, but I just put it together when I have a little spare time. Unfortunately, that's what we do with sometimes our Christian faith. It's like a little bit of a hobby. We put together our Christian faith in like a one-hour event on Sunday morning, and then when we leave here, it's all of a sudden we're different. It's like, do you ever drive uh, on any road, but always, when I was a kid, I couldn't figure it out. You'd be driving down Route 4, and my dad would say, you know, here we are, we're on Erie Highway. And all of a sudden you look and you're still on Route 4 or Erie Highway, but now it's called Dixie Highway. And all of a sudden you get a little bit down the road and you know what it changes into? Springfield Pike. And it's like 
every, it depends where you are and it goes by a different name. That's kind of like Christian sometimes. You know, it depends on where you are, when you are, and you just keep changing faces and names. But it shouldn't be that way, right? And, and if you're going to be an effective witness for Jesus, it's a 24-7, right? It's 24-7. Let's not make it something easier, make it something it's not. Because if you're going to be serving Christ, we're all in or we're all out. And if we're going to serve Christ and we're going to be a witness, and I say this to myself, then yes, we have to go to our jobs, and yes, we may have to go to school or wherever we are, but in every situation and every relationship, I'm going to be a witness for Christ, or I'm not. Right? That's what it means to be a prisoner of the Lord. It means at all times, in every situation, whether the sun's shining or whether it's raining outside, it doesn't matter. I'm a prisoner of the Lord, and it's by my choice. He chose me, and I've chosen him. He goes on to say, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. You've been called. I've been called. Now, he considered it a high calling. When he got the call on that road, when he was walking to, uh, remember the story in Acts, uh, where the Apostle Paul, we often say on the road to Damascus, he was once this priest, this Jewish priest, and he was blind to the faith that he thought he had in God, but actually he was blind to God. And there was this transformation. Jesus called him on that road that day. And he said, Paul, Paul. And the Bible says that he fell down and he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? It was at that point his life was changing. God was calling him. And he never forgot that calling. And he says, you should walk a worthy life of the calling you've received. Your high call. And so that's why introduce, and that's the introduction today to, to what we've been talking about. To be a witness for Christ, it's a high call. It's a high call. You're sometimes the person that you're standing when no one else is. That makes sense? In every situation, you're that light. I thank God when I was at home and sometimes my mom was that light to me. You know? Every situation, I seem like I go home and I'd fail in life. I go home and I'd walk in that living room sometimes and there she'd be. In the darkness over there, I knew where she'd be. And she spent an hour just praying in there. And she was a light to me. Sometimes I'd go in the bedroom and I remember and I'd shut the door and cry because I knew I'm a hypocrite. She's in there praying, and I no doubt she's praying for me. We're called by God to be a witness for Christ. A witness for Christ. And let us be what God has called us to be. Let's be what God's called us to be. Right? Paul Adams, be what God called you to be. And you say, well, don't be so hard on yourself. Well, that's between me and God. Right? That's between you and God. But today I'm going to be hard on myself. Because God's called me to be a witness. And, with, and if you say, I don't want to do that, or I want to do that, well, we'll all do it together. Or maybe you'll do it alone, but you won't be alone. Because whenever you say, I'm going to walk with God, God's going to walk with you. Yes? Anytime you say, I'm going to walk with God, which means you're going to be effective witness, then God says to you, I'm going to walk with you. The Bible's filled with stories. Every story in the Bible where someone walked with God, you always see God walk with them. It's inseparable. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
the empire of Babylon. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar, he said, unless you bow down and obey the law of the land, you're going to be thrown into this furnace and burned alive. And they responded. Do you remember? You remember the story? They said, we don't know if we'll live or die. But we do know this. We will not do what you've asked us to do. Our God, the Lord, we've given our lives to be with him. We're going to walk with God. The Bible says that they put them in the furnace. And you know what happened. Maybe you do. You remember the story? They looked into the furnace and they said, we threw in three men. But what do we see? We see four. And the fourth is like the Son of God. Anytime you walk with God, He walks with you. And if you go through a furnace, He goes into the furnace. And if you go out witnessing and sharing Jesus, you'll never be alone doing that. He has demonstrated what it means to see people saved. So, let's talk a little bit more then about where we've been. Where have we been? We've been talking about asking good questions. And then, as we've listened, and we are listeners to someone that we're talking to, we've asked some very good questions. We've asked them about what is their opinion about spiritual spirituality. We've asked their opinion about who is Jesus. And now we come to a place where we read the Word of God with them. So, I'm going to ask that each, I don't know how many people we have here today. Some of you may read more than one verse. But I'm going to ask then that we go around the room and let's pick some verses and let's listen to the power of these verses. So what this means, you've asked questions. You've asked these very interesting questions and this person that you're talking to has responded. And by their answers, you realize that God is at work and they have a great interest in spiritual matters. They have an interest in God. And now you lead them to a point where you've asked them to share by reading these scriptures. That means you may have your phone, have these verses saved in your phone. That's easy to do. Or you may have a small Bible that you carry in your purse or maybe it's in your pocket. But in any case, you have these verses that are marked. And now you're going to ask that person either to read them aloud or at least listen as you read them or... Maybe share as you read. You have, your, you have your phone and you're right there showing those verses to them so that they're reading with you. Preferably, they're reading aloud. And so we come to these verses. And so would someone read Romans, the first chapter, and verse 16? Anyone? So go to Romans, if you will, please. And let's spend some time reading these aloud. And let's make it as though we're sitting with someone. And you've come to this point, and now you've asked them to follow or read these verses aloud and listen to what these verses are telling us. Please. Mm -hmm. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Thank you. And then Romans, the third chapter, verse 23. <coughs> For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. John, the 14th chapter, verse 6. John, chapter 14, verse 6. And also, while you're looking at John, someone have John, chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come through the Father except by me, through me. John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved the world, that he gave the only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him, he must perish, and have everlasting life. 
2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 15. And he died for all that those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and were raised in him. And then finally, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, the 3rd chapter, and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and make the door, I will come into them and dine with them and he with me. Thank you so much for participating. The power of reading God's word, how powerful it is just in this room. This is God's word, and this is why it is so very important. When you are sharing Jesus with someone and asking them questions, it is to get them to the point of decision. This is where we're going, leading them to the point of decision. And in doing so, we are taking them down this road of Scripture, where God is going through the Holy Scriptures like a sword. Now, the Scripture says we are to put on the full armor of God. A helmet of salvation. And what is the word of God? It is the sword of the spirit. It is the sword. And what does a soldier do with the sword? Where is he going to pen He's going to penetrate, right, Brian? He's, he's going to penetrate. And often, where is he going to, in battle, he's going after the heart, right? Because if you penetrate the opponent's heart... You've completely changed your opposition, right? Now, spiritually, what does that mean? When I use the Word of God, or I should say, when God is at work using His Word, you are taking by faith a sword, a spiritual sword, and you're piercing a person's heart. You and I, we can't do that. But God's Word can. It effectively penetrates... And it enters into a place that only God can. That's the power of His Word. How often I've seen people's lives change and crumble at the power of the reading of His Word. You and I could argue with somebody, and they could contradict what you're saying, but how often when someone is engaged and reading God's Word, how powerful, what a change that can make in a person's life. Because it is the Word of God. It is a spiritual sword, and it pierces the heart. That's why it's so important that we all, how, how different it'll make your life and my life when you spend every day adequate time with the television off, with all the affairs of the world set aside, in God's Word. That is true. Very true. Your life each week will change dramatically by the amount of time you spend in God's Word. Think of that. You want a change to happen in your life, then that's the key. Spending time every day in God's Word, you try it and see if that's not true. Because God's Word is by the Spirit. And where the Spirit of God is, is His presence. And God's presence will change your life. So, we're leading someone to these verses, and as you read through these verses, notice the path that was taken. It shares as God's Word opens up their heart to see, first of all, I'm a sinner. And then it opens up the door to show that God provided a solution to sin. And that is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus came and he provided a way, the only way, to know God. And it's through him, by his death, that sins have been paid for, such that there is forgiveness offered. And Jesus has an invitation to every person who will hear and believe. So you can see the progression of these scriptures, which leads to these next five questions. Number one, now you, you bring this person to this place and you ask them a question. The last question is this. If you didn't know the truth, wouldn't you like to hear it? And that person most likely is going to think about that and say, of course, I'd like to know the truth. 
That opens the door to these scriptures. And then, at the close of the reading of these, now you may not read all of these scriptures. If God's working in a person's heart, you may just read two of these scriptures. You may read just John 3.16 with them, or Romans 10.9. But I think always it's important to close with this verse here. This is the invitation of Jesus. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with them. That means I'm going to have a relationship with him. I'm going to come into their heart. That's the invitation that God gives. And I think that is very powerful. And so now we ask the question, are you a sinner? Let's focus on these next five questions. So we ask the question, are you a sinner? Now, now think about this. Now think about this. Jesus died for the person you're talking to. Yes? He died for them. That's how much God cares about the person you're talking to. Think of that. Whoever that person is. I don't care what walk of life, whatever you may know about them or don't know about them. Know this. The person that you are now talking to is somebody that Jesus died on the cross for. That's a very serious thing, isn't it? Yeah. God sent his son and his son died for the person you're talking to just like he died for you. And so now you're there and this may be the last chance they get. Think of that. The person you're talking to at that moment, this may be the last chance they get. They're about to get on a sled ride and this is the last time they're going down that hill. I was with my uncle Truman at the hospital. And uh, my Uncle Truman said to me, and he worked on the l &M Railroad, and I remember him sharing to me, Paul, I, I worked, he was an engineer on a railroad, and he talked about all the different act, disasters and accidents they had on the train. And he, at that moment, was a lost man. He was not a Christian, and he was dying of cancer. And he said to me, Paul, I feel like I'm on my last train ride. And he started crying there in the hospital. And he said, and I'm not ready to die. Serious man. God was working in his heart. You say, well, what happened? Well, my cousin, his son, at that last moment before my Uncle Truman passed away, he called on a pastor of the church, actually where I was going, and Robert Skirvin at the middle, the midnight hour as he often did in my family and others. He left his house, got off his pajamas. He didn't wait till the next day when it was more convenient. But he got to that, he got to that hospital and he started reading God's word, he told me, and said my Uncle Truman reached out his hand, said it's time. God was there. God was there pleading with him before that last second came. And there they prayed together and during the night, he died. He was right. His train ride was about to come to an end. You see, sometimes you're that last person standing in the gap. Be prepared, be ready, and see the importance of your life. Because if you're not there, then that person may go into eternity because you weren't there. And that's true. That's why it's called the high calling. That's why it's called a high calling. Think of it. You've been called by God to stand in that gap. To stand up and say, wait a minute. You don't have to end your life like this. This is not God's purpose for you. And you are there representing God. And think of this. If God gave his son Jesus for that person, don't you know this? Don't, shouldn't I know this? You and I, we don't have to be afraid because if God loved that person so much that he put his son on the cross, then know this, you're there talking to that person and God is right there. God has been looking in on that person's life for a long time. And so you are there talking to them, sharing Jesus by reading his word, but God's spirit, is working in that person's life. All of heaven is right now at your disposal. That's the way you and I should think about it. You're not alone. 
God has been working for an eternity to see that that person saved. You say, well, does the Bible say that? Yes, it does. It says, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Also, the Bible says this, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God says. That's God's desire. And know this then, that you are there sharing Jesus with that person. You have a divine appointment. Think of this. When you talk about witnessing for Christ, we're talking about having a divine appointment with somebody. That's it. You have a divine, and it may be today. It may be today. You may have an appointment today that you're going to come into someone's path of life. And God has brought you in that person's life to share Jesus. Brian, it could be that somebody's getting on an airplane right now. And little do they know it, but they're getting ready to sit down next to a missionary. And that missionary has been given an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody that really needs to hear it. You know what I'm saying, don't you, Ryan? Right? You come across somebody in life, and man, their hope is almost all gone. The glimmer of hope, that candle is, is about to burn out. And God brings you into their life for that moment. Don't let it pass by. Don't let it pass by. And so we ask these questions. Number one, are you a sinner? Number two, do you want forgiveness for your sins? Number three, and we're going to share these, and next week, I, I, unless something happens, I promise, we're going to have a nice presentation to sum these things up. I know you've been taking notes. Number three, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again? Number four, are you willing to surrender your life to Christ? Number five, are you ready to invite Jesus into your life and into your heart? Those are the five questions. Those questions, as you can, if you listen to those, let me read them again and think about the scriptures that we just read from Romans to John, from Corinthians to Revelation. We just read about how we're all, and the Bible tells us the truth, we're all sinners. We all need Jesus. God and his love provided him so that we could be forgiven. He died for us. And that God is inviting us to open our hearts to him. This is the scriptures that we just read. And listen to these questions. Number one, we get to this point with the person after we've read these scriptures, we ask them, are you a sinner? Number two, do you believe that you need forgiveness? Do you have a desire to have forgiveness from God? Number three, do you believe that Jesus died? And rose again. Number four, are you willing to surrender your life to Christ? And number five, are you ready to invite Jesus? That's the most important pivotal question that you'll ever ask somebody. Are you ready to invite Jesus into your heart and life? Now that person says yes. Then it's important to ask them this question. I remember when I was... Uh, asked by Allie and Jake to conduct their wedding. Allie's my daughter. And not far from here, we had the wedding in the gazebo. And I asked this question of them both. I said, Allie, is it your desire? And I always ask this in a wedding. I don't do too many weddings, but I always like to do this. I like to look at the person's eyes because you can see their heart. I said, Allie, is it your desire to love Jacob Miller and to live with him, to be his friend, through good times and bad, is that really your desire? And boy, she had the biggest smile on her face, and she looked at Jake. She said, it is my desire. Then I asked Jake the same question, and he said, it's my desire. And I said, well, then, it's time to get married. When you're with that person and you ask them, would you like to invite Jesus in your heart and life, and that person says yes, then ask them this question. Sir, ma'am, whoever you're talking to, I want to be sure I understand it's your desire to invite Jesus into your life today. Think of that. And if that person, listen, if God's working in their heart and they say, I'm, yes, that's my desire, then you, you say to them, well, I want to pray with you. Knowing that it's, there's no magical prayer. I get so aggravated sometimes. We make 
receiving Jesus something that's not in the Bible. Someone said, oh, did you say the sinner's prayer? Well, like there's some magical formula. What we do know is this, though. The Bible does say whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I think it is important to lead them in prayer. And that prayer should involve two very important, very important spiritual truths. Number one, repentance. Number two, faith, which says, Lord, forgive me. I believe you died for me and I ask you to forgive me my sins. I want to live a new life. That's repentance. Number two, faith. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you were raised from the dead. And I believe that you are the son of God. That's faith. So I think your prayer should be led with that person in repentance and faith. To repent and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the formula according to the Bible. So now you've come to this point, and I think we'll come back to this next week. If the person says no, then what's next? If the person says no, that's not my desire. Then let's talk about that next week. All right, so I didn't realize we're so far. It's close to uh, going upstairs.